All right. Good morning, everyone. Yes, let there be light so I can see what I'm looking at here. All right, this morning, actually, I'm going to be doing kind of a two part message one this week, one next week on uh, 2023. Uh, I've been asking the Lord uh, for probably no next month or six weeks about what the Lord was saying about 2023. Just asking the Lord myself, and then also then trying to confirm with some other prophetic voices what, uh, what others were saying and see if it lined up or not. And so I've got several things I kind of want to go through. Unfortunately, today, most of it's going to be negative today. So you have to come back next week for the positive stuff, okay? Uh, even though, and remember the song we sang, God is good all the time. Even when things don't look like it, good, at least in our viewpoint. But it's good. He is good. So, Lord, I just ask just for your wisdom and direction and, and Lord, just uh, for clarity for what you want said to be said today, Lord. We just thank you for your word, Lord, and we, we just so appreciate it, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're going to be doing, I'm going to... Again, just speak some of the things I've been feeling the Lord has been saying to me. And then I'm also going to, after we get through that part, look at history, biblical history, and look at some scriptures through Acts and some things that have happened to the church that maybe we don't sometimes talk about a lot, but that we need to realize has happened. So as Amos said, Prophet Amos said, I was neither a prophet nor a son of a prophet. I almost kind of feel sometimes like that also. But he was a prophet. So, you know, just, just in the natural, looking at what, you know, like Barner studies say and, and many of the Christian surveys that have been going out for quite a while have said how the church, meaning those who are true believers who heard the word of God, is decreasing. It's going down. More knowns. You know, those who don't believe in anything is increasing. But those churches that really stand for the Word of God, the numbers are going down. And there's no way to uh, put on rose-colored glasses to, to, to say differently. I believe as a, as a nation that we're under a limited judgment. And what I mean by that, some people don't like the word judgment, but they prefer maybe discipline. But the Lord's judgments are always redemptive. I mean, he allows things to happen to wake people up. And if you go through biblical history and you look at, you look at the nation of Israel, you look at when uh, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, and after the prophets go warning and warning time and time again, the Lord would send minor judgments, whether it was a drought or whether it was a war, uh, a famine, different things, but the purpose was to wake up people to turn them back to the Lord. And of course, it didn't happen. You know, after his patient reached a point, then he decides enough is enough. And like in the case of uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire came in and wiped out Israel, the northern kingdom. And then about 120 some years later, Judah, the southern kingdom, same thing happened, except it was the Babylonians who came in. But again, the prophets had warned and warned and warned. And yet people did not turn. There was apostasy. They were serving other gods. And the Lord brought judgment. So, I guess the overall thing, I would say that you know, things are not going to get better in the natural in 2023. We're going to see, uh, again, I say in the natural. There's going to be an increase of shakings in our nation and also the nations of the world. Economy is going to be shaken. I think inflation is going to persist, and then we're going to move into a recession for a time. There's going to be conflicts between nations. 
the war and rumors of war, you know, Matthew 24. Now, this one is one I haven't had confirmation. All these others have had confirmation with other prophetic voices, but this one I haven't. But I just felt the Lord was, was saying to watch and pray for Mexico. Because Mexico could turn into another Haiti. And you know right now that Haiti is a lawless state. It's, it's basically run by gangs. And so we need to pray. Pray for Mexico. Pray for their government. Another thing was that the division within our country will increase. The culture war will intensify, which will bring an increase of persecution against the church and believers who hold to the Word of God. And we have to be honest and say, at the present time, we are losing the culture war. And we have been for decades. It's just a fact. And I think more churches are going to be begin to compromise the Word of God because of the persecution, because of the pressure. They're going to be forced, or not forced, they're going to, because they don't want to be persecuted, they're going to compromise the Word of God. And especially over issues like the LGBTQ and the trans, uh, trans stuff going on, all of that, uh, there's going to be a lot more pressure coming. And one thing I would say about that is that don't condone, or actually I say it this way, don't condemn, but don't condone. And how you walk that out, think about that. Don't condemn, but don't condone. And we, we may look at some more of that next week. Will there be a revival? I honestly don't think things have gotten bad enough yet. I think there's going to be pockets of revival breaking out, and I hope and pray that we would be one of those places. But the sleepy bride, it takes a lot to wake up the church, unfortunately. One of the sources I was looking at, too, for confirmation was the Apostolic Council of, of Prophetic Elders. Uh, there's a whole group of people who meet. You know, Jim Gall is one of them, Chuck Pierce. Uh, they all, there's a whole group that meet, and every year for the past 20 years, they kind of give out their kind of viewpoint of things they see coming. And one thing that I have uh, believed for many years was that there is a World War III coming. And it's going to take place sometime in the future. But the other thing was it can still be delayed by prayer. And for 10 years, they have seen an alliance between Russia, China, and Iran that would form an Axis power. Just like in World War II, there was Germany, there was Italy, and there was Japan was the Axis power at that time. And they even went on to explain how in World War I, they, before that happened, there was a major move for mission movements of where over 20-some thousand young men had dedicated themselves to go to the mission field, but then World War I started, and, a, and almost a majority of those were killed in the war. So it's not always good news. There's going to be more exposures, you know, in politics, but also in the church. There are going to be major churches, mega churches, that pretty well won't exist because of things that are uncovered. Now, my question for you this morning is, does persecution always bring about growth and revival in the church? And I can think of, you know, a couple of examples where it did. China, obviously. You know, after the communists came in, after World War II, the, the uh, underground church flourished. The house church movement flourished and grew, where there are now millions of believers in China. Now, Vietnam was another one, and, and a lot of people aren't as familiar with that, but, but during the 1950s, there was a, a group of alliance missionaries who went 
and began to minister in the central highlands of Vietnam. And it was a slow process of planting churches and seeing small growth over the years. And then actually in 1968, during the Ted Offensive, several of them were killed. But the church you know, was growing slowly. And then in 1975, when the communists from North Vietnam came in and took over, the missionaries had to flee, but revival broke out in the Central Highlands. And so that is still a flourishing church, even though they've been under persecution since that time, since 1975. But not always. And which is, a, I think, a warning to our nation. Because I want to look this morning at the, at the seven churches in Revelation, but I want to particularly focus on the church of Ephesus. Because it was a revival center. So let me give you some facts about Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was the largest church in Asia Minor, what is now today Turkey. Had over 250,000 residents. It was a uh, Roman city. Uh, it had the temple of Artemis in there, or Diana, whichever you want to call it, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. So it was a, a major city, the biggest city in Asia Minor. So we're going to pick up the story uh, in Acts 19. But before, I want you to get to kind of the timeline again. So think when the church is birthed during Pentecost, okay? The center is in Jerusalem. So that's the center of the church. Then persecution came, and it scattered them out. Okay, the center of Christianity moved to Antioch. And Antioch is where they were first called Christians. It was also the place where Barnabas and Saul and uh, Paul were sent out to the nations during the great missionary trips, apostolic trips. And then from Antioch, it moved further west into Ephesus, became the center. Okay? So kind of keep that in your mind in the timeline. Okay, so let's go to um, Acts 19, and we're going to read the first 20 verses. And it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, Then what what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, and that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So that's where the church starts, okay, in Ephesus. About 12 men. Now, Paul entered the synagogues and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to be believed and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. Now, this went on for about two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Now, some Jews who went about driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. 
Now, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating, they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, they told about 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So, he, all the Jew, you know, it says all the Jews in Asia and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the news. Now, did Paul go to all these other cities or towns? He did not. But since Ephesus was the main city and it was a revival city, people were coming and going. And so they would come, many of them would get saved, and then they would go back to their town and it would break out of church and revival there. Now, Paul was there uh, for three years, which is, he was there longer than any place else he, in any of the, his missionary journeys. So for three years, he ministered there. And it says there was extraordinary miracles that were happening. So a major revival, major move. And over $5 million worth of books and scrolls were burned. So there were true repentance happening because the people were taking action. They were not just hearing the word. They were doing action. They were destroying what their, their sorcery, the witchcraft stuff they were using. They were burning it. Okay, so to give you uh, a bit of a timeline. So Paul started that church. He was there for three years. And then about 10 years later, Timothy took over the Ephesus church. And after that, then John the Apostle became the apostle or the pastor over Ephesus. So then it takes us to uh, Acts chapter 20. And we're going to start in verse 17 there. And we're going to go to 38. So we'll just go to the end of the chapter. It says, from Metellus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders, because Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem, okay? Now, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came to the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my, li- my life nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. 
I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit to you, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not covered anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, when he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was this statement, that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ships. So for, again, he says, for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. And if you think of that verse that I Jude 4, it says, Godless men who change the grace of our God into license for immorality. So what happens next, we're going to fast forward, keep your time frame going, about 40 years, okay? So 40 years in the future now, we're going to Revelation chapter 2. And I might mention that, um, you know, the message to the seven churches was not only historical, but it also speaks to us, you know, about, it tells us the values that we are to embrace and the things that we are to avoid. So it still has uh, life for us today. And for each of the churches, he gives an affirmation, and then he gives a correction. Now, the correction is not rejection. Correction means correct. I'm trying to get you guys to correct, get in the right direction. So Revelation chapter 2, we're coming to, we're just going to read the one about the church in Ephesus. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, And your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you you have forsaken your first love. Remember the heights. From which you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from his place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So he gives basically three things to do. Remember, repent, and take action. Okay, remember where you've fallen from. Repent and act. Take action. So it brings us to a question. Okay, how do you forsake your first love? What happens to people? Of course, we also have the part where where Paul warned them about false teachers coming in. Wrong doctrine could well be part of that. But also, I think, what about the, the, uh, the delays of God? I thought something was going to happen that hasn't happened. What about the disappointments? Things you were hoping for, things you were believing for, 
didn't happen. About unanswered prayers, or at least what we perceive as unanswered prayers. I don't think there is any unanswered prayers. It may just be that they didn't turn out what we wanted our prayers to be. The worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. There's one thing about the Christian life, you know, I've told you guys before many times, you know, this, this walk or this race is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And many people who start strong, running fast, over the years, because of disappointments, because of things that happen, because of offenses, whatever, they quit. But if you don't quit, you win. And we need to learn a lot about perseverance and endurance. Now, God's calling on everyone is not a position or a title. It is the great commandments. You know, love the Lord thy God with all their heart, with all their mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And also the great commission about going. Now, here's a fact. All these seven churches and revelations were in what is today modern-day Turkey. Okay? So picture that, all in this in Turkey. You know what the population, what the percentage of Christians is today in Turkey? It is 0.02. Pretty well non-existent. So what happened? That was a revival center. That was a center of Christianity. And yet, the warnings that Paul gave, I think, happened. The church was weakened itself. And then when persecution came in, because what happened was Islam came in. And they were under great persecution. And a lot of them were killed. And some of those who weren't killed, they became like second-class citizens where you don't have the same rights as the Muslims do, you don't have the same opportunities. And so because of that, and because of the weakened state of the church, many, in fact, I would say most, turned away from the Lord. And it was easier just to deny the Lord and become a Muslim. Also, during the Armenian genocide, which happened later, 1.5 1.5 million Christians were killed by the Ottoman Empire. So there was great persecution. So even though we say many times that the church prospers during times, of, but not always. Many times the enemy comes in and because of the weakened state of the church is able to snuff the church practically out. Now, if you want more information, <clears throat> there's a book written by, uh, his name's Irvin Lutzer, L-U-T-Z-E-R. Uh, it was called The Cross and the Crescent. And he talks about what happened when Islam came in to Turkey, to Asia Minor at the time, and how they basically pressured and snuffed out Christianity. He also wrote another good book. It's called Hitler's Cross. And that book is talking about how when the Nazis co-opted the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church in Germany, and basically got them to do what they wanted to do. And there were very few who stood against it. You have people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who stood against it in the confessing church. It cost him his life. And so there are very things that we need to, to really be aware of, and, and just for our own nation. You know, it, it's a warning. You know, we don't want to fear the future, but at the same time, we need a sober realization of where we are at and what has happened to our nation over these last decades and how we have changed in such a radical way. Is there hope? Oh, yeah, there's definitely hope. And we'll talk about that next week. 
I just want to ruin your day for today. <laughs> Give you something to come back for next week. But yes, there is hope. God has answers for all those things. But there does have to be a response. Because we have to remember, we have to repent, and we have to take action. And so it's all, all negative. But I think, again, we just have to have that sober realization that where we are at as a nation, where we are at as a church, I'm speaking across the nation, what the health of the church really is and how it needs to turn and how we need revival, true authentic revival, and we need a a third great awakening to come to this nation because that's our only hope because if we keep on the trajectory that we are going now, it's not going to be good. It's not good. It's not a good future for our kids and grandkids. And so we need to really bear down, get into serious prayer, intercession, examining our own lives, and take action. So that's my encouragement for today. But again, God's in control. He knows the the end from the beginning. Uh, There's nothing that we need to fear. We just need to be locked in, focused, and set our priorities in the right way. Because what happened also in those churches was that the priority of the Lord all of a sudden began to move down in their lives. Other things began to push out the Lord. And slowly, you know, no one just all of a sudden just rejected the Lord. It happened bit by bit by bit. And it happens today just like that. Slowly people begin to turn away. Slowly they begin to find other things that are more important in their life than the Lord. As Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us examples. You give us warnings. We thank you, Lord, that, that even your, your discipline and your judgments are meant to turn us back to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you care for us, that you have a plan and you have a future if we will cooperate with you. So, Lord, we ask for that insight. We ask for wisdom. We ask for direction, Lord, to help us, Lord, to be some of those agents, Lord, that prepare the way of the Lord making ready your second coming, Lord. And Lord, we thank you. We treasure your word. We love you. We honor you. We worship you. There is nothing more important than you. You are our magnificent obsession, Lord. We long for you. And we long for more of you. We long for more of your presence, Lord, in our lives, Lord. Lord, would you take out the dross of our life, Lord? Would you cleanse us from all impurity? Lord, would you make us hungry and thirsty to truly seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness? Lord, do a work within us, Lord. Renew our minds by the washing of your word. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Enlarge us, Lord. And Lord, we ask for that increase of the supernatural in our life. We ask for the gifts of the Spirit to increase. Lord, we ask for that gift of faith and the working of miracles. Lord, we ask for that gift of prophecy, for words of wisdom, for words of knowledge, for that gift of discernment, for tongues, for interpretation, for those gifts of healing. Everything that you have for your people, Lord, we need. We want our tool belt full of your gifts and callings, Lord. So, Lord, help us. Equip us, Lord. Prepare us, Lord. Lord, we ask for those prophetic eyes to see and to hear what you're saying and what you're doing. We want to line up our lives before you, Lord. Lord, we we love you. We desire you. Lord, come, Holy Spirit, visit your people. 
Lord, just as you did on that day of Pentecost, as you poured out your spirit, Lord, a fresh move of your spirit. We're crying out, Lord, for the more. We're not satisfied with where we're at. We're asking for the more, more of your presence, more of your power. In Jesus' mighty name. Okay, we're going to have a, a few minutes of worship. And anyone who needs prayer, whether it's for healing, relationship, you need to repent, whatever is going on, let's have that expectancy that the Lord is going to meet us. He's able to touch our lives and change us. He's able to save this nation. But he needs us to take our place and be in that place of prayer and intercession. But let's believe that God is going to touch lives here this morning. So whatever that need is, feel free to come up during this time of worship. Some of the elders will be up here and we'll be glad to pray for you. And let's keep seeking first the kingdom of God.